This week, Drew, Adam, and I have the opportunity to interview Abe DeBabna. Abe is the owner and founder of Smoke In, growing from a single store to the largest retail operations in the cigar world, and also in Florida and in the country. Smoke In has 11 locations, stretching from Port St. Lucie to Margate. They have a website. Visit them at smokein.com. We're going to learn all things about Abe's journey. He also has a podcast. I'm sure you've heard of it. Anyone in the cigar world probably knows who this gentleman is. Stogie Geeks episode 360 starts right now. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Hosempa, a.k.a. Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. So we also have remote Drew, who is remote over in Texas. Look at you. You got some Stogie Geek swag going on in the background. Got my banner. Where are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm all set up for the uh, Stogie Geek uh, mobile lounge. Confidence. Confidence isn't walking into a room with your nose in the air, thinking you're better than anyone else. It's walking into a room and not having to compare yourself to anyone in the first place. Cigars, perfected for more than 150 years. Yours to enjoy now. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 360 of Stogie Geeks. I am your host, Joe Hosempa. Privilege and an honor to sit here. Joining me in studio, we have none other than the famous Adam from <laughs> Havana Cigar Club next door. What's going on, Joe? <laughs> Adam is totally poaching this interview. He uh, found out that Abe was coming on, and he just sat in a chair, lit up a cigar, and sat down. So, um, Adam, welcome back to uh, being in studio. I appreciate you letting me sit in on this. Oh, yeah. Like, actually, I had to stop a lot of people at the door when mm. people started finding out. Because we, we don't do a lot of, like, uh, promotions and stuff like that. You know, it's just like you watch Story Geeks, go to the website, check it out, li- listen, and there you go. And then people start like, who do you have tomorrow? Ape. Can I come and do that? And I'm like, no, 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 no. We still have a COVID thing going on and all of that stuff, you know. Uh, anyway, we have my little doc kid, kid from Texas, Mr. Drew Galvin. How are you? What's up, Joe? Doing very well, man. Just enjoying the day. I'm excited to get this uh, guest kicked off. Abe, I mean, he's been a busy, busy man. Seems yeah. like since 1996, at least. And probably before that, just like the rest of us. Yes, he age. has. Yeah. Yes, he has. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, you know, a lot of my, a lot of our people are, are excited that, you know, we're getting to talk to this gentleman. So, and, uh, you know, just doing the pre uh, video and audio check. I mean, his his look matches his voice so that's even awesome oh yeah <laughs> for me yeah yeah his, uh, <laughs> uh, his persona and whatnot so that's that's pretty good so but uh yeah look forward to getting with uh abe and let's dig into it brother awesome absolutely uh this week we interview abe Babna. he's the founder of smoke in i encourage you to go to smoke in.com story geeks if you do not know who this gentleman is and wants to read his extensive resume you can go to storygeeks.com forward slash 360 that's this episode number and we're going to talk about all those highlights in the resume so we're just going to jump right into it abe welcome back to story geeks how are you sir
and there you go. See, no, <laughs> no, no experience doing this whatsoever. Right? <laughs> How's it go, Drew? <laughs> Joe, uh, Drew, Adam? How's everybody today? Everybody's great, I think. Everybody, I don't want to answer for everybody, but I guess I, I did, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> kind of did. For hell, I mean, I mean uh, you, you weren't know. wrong about it, though. I must say that Nelson, our other co-host, is so bummed that uh, he can't be here for this interview. But as we speak, he's actually touring the J.C. Newman factory. So, oh, you know, it, it can't be all that bad either, no. right? That's a nice tour. Yeah, and he's a little punk because he got to Florida before I could from COVID. So <laughs> that's what happens when you have teenagers versus a two-year-old, Abe. I, I can't pivot that fast, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a baby coming up in uh, probably eight oh, days. Eight congrats, days. brother. Good for you. Yeah, man. Kid two, boy two. So... I'm, ex right. I'm excited. Right. Are you done? Is the factory closed? Or I, I, the factory's not closed, but you know we're, there still is some risky business. But we're we're getting up there in age, so you know right. we're, we're gonna have to have a talk. That's you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, we're gonna have to do something. But believe me, I can talk to you about tons of other stuff besides cigars. So you know. Anyway, Abe, um, th uh, thank you for for joining us here on Story Geeks. I, you know, if you want to catch Abe's first interview that he did with Story Geeks, all you can do is go to storygeeks.com, type in Abe. It'll How come, long ago was that? Uh, off the top of my head, that was 2017, and it was okay. around March or April. This is all off the right. top of my head, so give me 90 days swinging each way. I'm very impressed. You know, but I, I didn't look it up. I didn't have it in my show notes. I, I really don't do a lot of show notes, right? Uh, uh, the, the format of this show has uh, uh, changed pretty drastically, I think, now that, uh, you know, P Paul is is not r uh, really active here. He's been on three times in one year. Um, and uh, pre pre previous hosts have left and done their own thing. And uh, I am guess I'm left here to do my thing, which I think is super cool. And, um, you know, I want to thank the listeners and, and, and everyone that we have a chance to interview. It's, it's so much fun, you know. But you... you I want to talk about kind of like the industry, right? Uh, I see it through the eyes of someone here in who's in the Northeast, right? Um, so jealous of your cigar culture down there in Florida. Like it, it just it's just an amazing time. I tell people all the time here in shops in the Northeast, you can't judge the culture how it's here within our geographical location, you got to go down to Florida. There are so many, you know, I, I took my son to Kaya Ocho, had such a good time, uh, took the family there, uh, you know, tours of, of the mini factories, going to Ybor City. Uh, I actually broadcasted my show, and we're going to begin with this. Uh, I actually broadcasted uh, the, the business roundtable from one of your smoke-ins. Which Actually, one? Uh, the one in West Palm Beach. How, really? Yeah. You know what happened? I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin with this story because I, I'm assuming that there'll be a part two and three because we'll just run out of time, right? But I actually just totally unsolicited walked into your um, smoking in West Palm Beach. This was uh, September of 2018, right? And I said, hi, how you doing? My name is Joe. I do a, a radio show. Oh, you guys, we're all set. We're all, no, 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 no. I'm not trying to sell you advertisements <laughs> for a radio show. I want to know where I can sit that would be just a little quiet. I don't need it totally quiet, but I'm going to do my radio show. So he showed me the patio out there. And there was a bunch of guys that this, were... This was, were the, this, was, this was the old location before the bar. Yeah. Yes. There was no, there, there was no, no, when I say bar, there was no like full scale bar. With yeah, booze yeah yes, yes. It was the old, low, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yep. So the, the, there was a bar, but there was yeah, no that, seating. That was a mock there. bar where just people sat. Yep. You know, like, yep. Okay. So you, you, you kind of had a bar and then, and then you had some, some, some Other chairs. chairs right. right. And then you had the courtyard right in front. Yep. So I was in yeah. the, I was in the, uh, the, the patio and I sat in the corner and you had some regulars there that, that, you know, every shop has them. The guys that show up every morning and read the paper and do their thing and, and did it 10 minutes right, right before your employee. And so I set up and they're like, what are you doing? And, and then they were like, I was like, oh, I'm doing a show. And he was like, oh, okay. And then they're like, you know, the guy who owns this place has a show. I'm like, I, I know who he is. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm experienced, you know, 
I never mentioned Stogie Geeks. I never said, hey, you know, I have a podcast too or anything like that. You know what I mean? I'm like, I, I well, uh, believe me, I, I, I know who, who, who Abe is. And I had such a good time. And then my cousin actually drives. He's a captain of a cruise ship. And he texts me and he goes, did you check into a smoke in? He's like, yeah. He goes, I just pulled in port. And he he's a, was a cruise ship from Spain. And he just oh, happened wow. to be there. And we spent the whole day there. Like the whole day there, oh, and, awesome. and and it was so cool. I didn't move out of the chair, and everybody kept visiting me just from doing that. And I did the the business roundtable, and it was super cool. So, um, cool. but it was funny. It was like, yeah, I have you know, I have a radio show. Oh no, 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 we're all set. We we, we don't want any do any advertising. Well, somebody's always coming in to try to sell some advertising. Of course so. they are. That's of course they are. Good. So anyway, that's my experience with the smoke. And then I visited the one over in Pompano because we stayed over in Fort Lauderdale. So super cool place. You have, a, a, you know, I, I don't want to talk like really about some of the retail stuff. Um, I just want to get into kind of questions if that's okay. Yeah, man. I All, right. Here. All right, Drew, I know you're dying. Go for it. Nah, so how many locations do you have now, Abe? Or how many locations? Now, are there's, there's 10 total locations of which I wholly own five, and there's five licenses. Okay. All right. Would you ever do, all consider the, doing a, a license here in the Northeast? Okay, next oh. question. <laughs> you know, you know, j just so you know, I mean, we get, I get asked like, literally once a month minimum. The the, the, the guys who are light smoking licensees, two of them are two of them are former employees. Um, uh, the other one is one of our merchant processors. The other one's a dear friend. It, these weren't like, it, this wasn't a model that we wanted to go open up ten stores. Mm -hmm. There were 50 stores that make a lot of smoke ins. These were situations where guys who worked for me went up in the ranks, wanted their own opportunity, or friends who saw an opportunity. And and it, it's it's nothing that we are looking to expand on as far as opening up like more licensees. I mean, we we haven't done one. I think the last one was uh, it's got to be over a decade, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. You know, so it's people who move up the rank and people who you absolutely yeah, trust. Friends, certain opportunities. I mean, I mean, look, it's not easy to keep, you know, everything standard and uniform. So these are guys I trusted who, who, who understood the business and understood, you know, the culture we built here wouldn't do anything that would harm, you know, the name and, and the integrity that we built over the years. Um, but you know, building stores isn't the problem. It's it's finding people who will run them right because i can't be everywhere and even some of the best guys in my team can't be everywhere so and and it's worse today than i've ever seen in my life everybody yeah. in the state of florida right now that i know from the from the west coast to the east coast is dying to find people to work and nobody wants to work it's mm. mind -blowing. yeah yeah and 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 it's not just the premium cigar industry it's oh no, it's, it's everybody yeah everybody yeah. restaurants bars everybody yeah mm -hmm. absolutely that yeah. that whole hospitality sector has been has been hit pretty hard but you know they'll have to find a way to adapt in business and 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 move forward the best they can i'm sorry drew for interrupting i'm i'm just no 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 you're good brother <laughs> no you're good i mean we, we, we're getting the goods out of abe so no i just you know with that you know like i said you know here you know, here in Texas, we, I mean, even, you know, where I'm at now, I'm at my day job. I'm in the bunker right now. But uh, even with us, man, we can't find any employees right now. And you can't find really quality employees. And so it's, uh, but I get that. I mean, I wouldn't want to expand my business if, if this was my, uh, you know, like know me and I with the art, art lounge. You know, we don't, exp you can't duplicate the care and the the, the ownership. It's art. Uh, yeah, it's hard. It's just very hard to do that. So you just can't do that, and then, and you, you just kind of let it just just make it right the first time, and they'll come. Which is our, uh, what I've seen. Our interview process is only really pretty extensive, and you know, we really want to get to know somebody. And like now, our new policy is: is he breathing? Yep, hire him. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hire him. We'll, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll, we'll figure him out. <laughs> but yeah, hire him. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's <laughs> like I just need a body here, right? I uh, mean. It's Abe, I, I, I guess the kind of theme for this interview, I, I, I do want to talk about your event. I do want to talk about online retail. Uh, I do want to talk about 
um, you know, what, what, what the industry and, 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 you know, what kind of future predictions you think are for the industry. Uh, obviously, we could talk a little bit about COVID. I want to talk about all, all, all of that if we can without me just like loading questions. But right. I, I preach a lot on this show when we interview um, all different types of people who are involved in the cigar uh, community or, or you know, in lifestyle and some products, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, I, I guess the theme for this, I kind of, I'm, I'm thinking of this now, is like, it's like gravity, right? Like, you know, I've been personally watching you or listening to you. Uh, obviously, we're friends on social media. Like, you, you, you have a lot of super cool qualities that I really, uh, you know, that I really kind of like started when I did Cigar Club Radio on Terrestrial Radio. I was like, this guy's like gravity. Like, there's something about him that, you know, went from following you from, from the Kiss My Ass Radio over to the KMA Radio Network. Uh, you had a big event. Uh, it became an online event, right? Uh, always hear about you. You're obviously a family man, so so family's important to you. Like you, you like like I just want to say like like it, it's just like gravity. So if you can kind of take us through all of that and like like what flocks people to you, because I think a lot of the retailers who tune into this show, who ping me, kind of like not to make them all like mini use, but. You know, from COVID, I just hear ex so many excuses on so many levels, and you just seem like someone in the industry who just kind of does his thing. Does that make sense? I mean, it's kind of what I've always said. I just kind of really just do my thing. Um, you know, when you, I don't see it, and it's kind of funny. My wife and I have these conversations all the time. Sometimes. Um, the gravity that you're talking about because I'm just living it. So a lot of times, like I'm shocked. I'm shocked when like a couple months ago, people, a couple who are in Alaska who found us during COVID became our customers. And, and you know, not just became our customers, became like devout customers and friends and people we've never met on social media and then happened to be on vacation in New Orleans and decided to not even check out of their hotel. They had this vacation planned for a year. They were here, um, I think it was January or maybe, maybe December. I think it was January, maybe December. But they 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 checked. They didn't even check out of their hotel, got in a car and drove 14 hours to come to our store here in Boynton Beach because they figured that was going to be the closest they'd be here from Alaska. Spent Friday and Saturday here. We went out to dinner with them. We hung out in the shop and then drove back to New Orleans to finish the vacation. I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, this is like, so wild that people do this and my wife's like you know it, it this happens all the time around you um so sometimes i think you're just so close to the forest you know you don't see the trees but you know i just always never been one to complain i try to teach this to the guys that work with you know here at smoke and you know complaining is an inefficiency of energy whining is an inefficiency of energy uh, the effort it takes to whine and complain and bitch about something could be energy used to solving a problem. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, and that with somebody with four kids, this is something I'm trying to embed in their mentality from an early age because absolutely nothing comes from whining or complaining. And 99.99% .99 of the time, where you're whining and complaining too, really doesn't want to hear it. So why bother? You have a problem, address it head on, deal with it, think of a way to get around it, think of a way to get through it. And, um, you know, I try to learn from my mentors that I've had over the years watching other people. Um, a lot of the things we do aren't original ideas. I mean, it's hard to have original, original ideas these days. We just kind of see something and then we say, well, you know, how can we make this better? And I think that's where we've kind of been successful a lot over the years. And like you said, you know, it's not like, we're not paying attention. We're always paying attention, but we we don't worry. We just kind of do what we want to do and kind of do our thing. We've come to learn that if you look at this business and you look at it in, in terms of experiencing people, that's why I like to say I'm in the business and, you know, the, the business of, you know, bringing experiences to people and the cigars are a byproduct of what we all like that brought us all together to have these experiences. And that philosophy's uh, worked out well for us. 
Yeah, I like, you know, it's funny because, like, sometimes I sit in shops and they're like, oh, you know, the COVID, or I'm not online, or I'm not doing, and, and I'm like, okay, like, you like, want me to help you get online? Like, I'm not, you know, like, like you, you can get online quicker, like, especially now. Not to, the, not to the extent as to your URL, but at least... I'm sorry for you, Story Geeks listeners. URL website, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You know, uh, you know. It, it, but we can at least set up something. And I've actually took the liberty and set up a couple of uh, what are those when they were locked down? What, what was that you guys went through? The lockdown, a uh, uh, curbside, the, oh, curbside, the curbside pickup, pickup yeah. right? And I was like, yeah, you know, you can get that done. You know, do a square for now. Get it done. Get your name out there. Make it safe. Get through COVID. You know, blah, blah, blah. R- remember when we were all staying home for 90 days to flatten the curve? Here we are like 15 months later. Mm, great. Right? <laughs> but, but you know, and, and, and I'm like, you know, then you take the baby steps and then you do that. And, and like, I'm, I'm always trying to, and they're always like, but Joe, but Joe, you don't understand. You understand. Listen, I own a little retail shop in the province metro. Back in 99 through 2004. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, I know what you're going through. I have a small business now. I know exactly what you're going through. And, and they sit there and they complain. And that's great advice to just not complain. We all know the help, really, the situation is bad. Mm-hmm. But you got to get out there and you got to make a positive place for your place. You got to make your shop a destination, whether you have a, 10 of them or whether you have one of them. And I've been t- t- preaching that all the time. And look, like you said, it's all scalability, right? I mean, yeah, a guy just getting in today maybe can't do a website like we have, but, you know, this this has been a 25-year process. You know, I mean, we started out where when we built a website, whatever it was, 15 years ago, if we got two orders a month, we were doing cartwheels. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> found us. So, but doing nothing never pays. Right. Right? Doing absolutely nothing never pays, but the problem is, we will become a society where it's just so much easier to complain about something than to act upon it or do something about it, you know? Um, and that's kind of what social media has done. It's given everybody this voice to whine and complain about something they don't like. Because somewhere along the way, we were taught that somebody really wants to hear our complaints or what we don't like about the world or don't like this. Nobody really does. Right. We all have stuff that we don't like. I mean, you could focus on what you do like. Or if you really don't like something, focus on how to change it. But right. to focus, just complain about it publicly, keep throwing it out there, and it doesn't work. And and, and I, I've come to to learn just from the people I've been blessed to work around, know and how they've run their businesses. Very such people, and that's kind of the mentality that gets people further along in life. So um, I try not to never complain. You know, we 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 were very challenged all last year very challenged this year you know we, we had, we've had a big big problem that arised this week of a zoning a, a building problem in our new warehouse so we were, we're building a new warehouse we signed the lease last september they just gave me the keys a week ago we started construction and the city of boynton beach shut it down contractor sends me this email i'm furious i don't know blah, blah, blah. like a paragraph this big all he's doing is whining complaining not telling me any solution of how he wants to attack this. So I literally call four or five guys on my team. I say, I need everybody in this organization to reach out to every single person that you think may or may not even have some influence anywhere. Mm-hmm. Because all our shops and all the people we know, I guarantee you, somebody knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody in the building department of Boynton Beach. Yep. <laughs> we, we, we need to get a hold of somebody we can sit down and have a conversation with because these people are all working from home. So you can't even go into the office or the building to have a conversation to, sure. to, to debate and to find out what could speed this process along. And sure enough, one of the guys last night found somebody. I was on the phone earlier today. She took all my information or whatever. But I could have sat here and complained. I could have sat here and listened to my contract to complain, but that doesn't do anything. So literally just all we had to do was start asking everybody. One, one of my guys has a a club actually secretary of state um evan darnell from the red meat lovers club who we do the red meat lovers club cigar with i mean he's got a big network of men i reached out to him he put a video on his club hey anybody know anybody in mm-hmm. boynton beach asking for a friend and unfortunately a lot of comic books boynton beach yeah you're screwed give it up it's terrible so what we're experiencing <laughs> is not just us it's everybody but um you know it's really holding us up and it's holding us you know from opportunity of making another you know six to eight jobs in the area 
which we'll probably won't find people who want to come in and work at this point. But mm-hmm. um, <laughs> it's it's crazy. But yeah, I, I just, the mentality that we try to live by every day, and I try to instill in my staff is don't do what you think comes naturally to you and complain when there's a problem. Yep. First instinct you should have is okay. How can we get around this problem? How do we get through this problem? Yep. And if you do that, you'll accomplish more things in your life. Yeah, you just yep. uh, put a big grin on my face because that's how I go through with my customers uh, That for my business. I'm like, I'm a problem solver. They yep. need something, and we and we, and we we figure it out. You know what I mean? And, and so uh, I'm excited about that for sure. In reality, yeah. I can think of very few, if very little, moments in my life where I've exhausted everything and couldn't find some remedy or some partial solution and said, there's nothing we can do. That's just the way it is. I mean, I can't, I can't even recall one. Yeah. You know, cause you know, I mean, and I'm sure it may have happened, but it's happened so few that I can't even recall it off the top of my head. But we just said, there's absolutely nothing we can do. That's just the way it is. Right. I, I've talked a lot of cigar, local cigar shop owners off the bridge, some of them daily. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but you know, and, and I'm just like, listen, like you gotta you gotta figure it out, like and and, and there are various problems. We can do a whole episode on freaking shenanigans that you know that the premium cigar industry and hoops that we all have to jump through and whatnot. But again, we'd be complaining and exposing more of the Captain Obvious stuff there. So, want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, and then we'll we'll have a question for for Adam and Drew. Um, what's your take? Obviously, uh, if my take is online work, your take is clearly online is super imperative for any brick and mortar premium tobacco shop to get there online. What's your what's your take on kind of some of these restrictions that throwing around the Jenkins Act possibility of not being able to ship in your partic- uh, out of your state? Or I know with one of my customers, they're located uh, physically in the state of Massachusetts. And if they order online, they can't ship to Massachusetts. And he's like, what are we going to do? What are we gonna do? I'm like, I'm going to do in-store pickup. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you have a retail store. You know what I mean? So, like, right. what, what's your, like, like, obviously, as a business, as a business person, you're clearly on all of that in the kind of forecast for that. Because I don't think online's going away. I mean, obviously, I work in cybersecurity, so I know it's not going away, but how it relates to premium tobacco. I, I, so, first off, I just want to correct one thing. or not correct, but my opinion on one thing is online is not imperative. Um, okay. You can make a successful career because, look, I, I know exactly what my stores do in store, what they do online. And we could run a very extremely successful business never selling something online. Mm. And and we're still a very dominant force here in South Florida, have been. In fact, we were a dominant force without the website before we actually got into the website. Um, so you, you could do it. Um, online became more relevant, obviously, when stores shut down across the country. But you have to be careful because typically there's not one, there's not a universal answer for everybody. And that's what I think some of the people did to online. Just go online. And it's not the answer for everybody because if you can't commit yourself to what it takes to have online and maintaining online and updating and adding new things, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication and just creating the site and like put it up online. No, man, you need the manpower. Whether you're going to be up all night at two, three in the morning. Listen, I ran our website for years and we had no graphic people. That was me. You know, I was doing product photography. That was me. So, you know, it's it, it's a commitment. So a solution is not a solution if the execution is not behind a solution. So, but if you were a local guy and you were shut down, there were things you could have done. We opened up a whereby zoom, which anybody could have done for free. Um, and 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 got the community involved and, and still had done stuff and delivered. So if you were innovative and you wanted to think out of the box and how can I I'm a local retailer, now I can't open my doors. But there are guys out there and they're still going to want to smoke probably more than ever now because they're at home and they're not going to work. How do I communicate with these guys? Well, as a retailer, you should have most of your customers phone numbers. You should have most of them email. Mm. You could have built free whereby rooms, free chats, had them socialize. You could have done specials. You could have dropped them off. You could. So the online answer isn't the, the, the broad stroke answer for everybody involved because it takes a lot of execution 
and a long-term commitment before you even see see some fruits of that labor. And um, some people aren't prepared for it, um, can't have the resources to commit to make that work. But you know, when you're ready, and if you do do it, it, it you can be very successful at it. It's not like impossible to get in the online game. It, it is, but like most business or most most ventures you go into having a clear understanding of what you're in store for will increase your chances of success. So um, I just wanted to clarify on that. But as far as what goes on, I've been hearing about the Jenkins Act and laws and this, and you all know what we went through with the FDA. And look, I'm never, I'm never this doom and gloom kind of guy. So I don't stay up at night. Listen, South Fontana, I don't know if who listening knows who South Fontana is. He's a legend in this industry and one of my mentors when i first got in he helped build carib imported cigars it became camacho cigars mm -hmm. which, which i got sold by davidoff basically was a mentor to christian aroa good friends with julio aroa and i had the uh, bless the honor and privilege of basically being exposed to him like almost every day of my life and um yeah, he wants to give me the best advice and if, if, if moving in heaven and earth won't change something why are you going to worry about it and, you know, that statement still sticks to me today. So I don't get caught up in worrying. I like to be proactive when it makes sense, but not to the point where you're obsessing about something that may or may not happen. I'd rather fight because, look, most predictions are wrong. That's why the predictions, you know, I mean, everybody who made a prediction or thought they knew what was coming ahead was right all the time. You know, no one would ever make a wrong move or a mistake. So just probability wise, what think people are going to happen and what's going to happen typically is wrong more often than not, or it doesn't end up being the final outcome. So to just have a blended mentality of going forward and hedging what may or may not happen and maybe being a little more prepared should something happen. But I like to, I like to take courses of action. Once I have solid ground, I really know what the road looks like ahead of me. So I don't spend a lot of time obsessing. I mean, I got friends in this industry who call me. Oh, you, oh, you know what they're gonna do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know. And I, and I, I'll help fight it. I will gain as many signatures for Cigar Rights of America. And you know, we sign people up every year at our great event. And I'll, you know, I'll do what I can. And if I got to go to some, you know, local congressman's office, which I've done, or go to Washington D.C., I'll do what I can. But you can't obsess about these things because then it keeps you from doing what you have to do on an everyday business, which is run your business and service your customers. Because I know guys and, and people are friends of mine who get really obsessed with that and that's what they fight all day. And meanwhile, what's going on in their, inside their walls of their business is being neglected. So it, it's a balance. So I'm not one of these guys who overly like freaks out or obsessed or stay up at night and, oh, if they do this to me, I don't know what they're gonna do. I mean, if there's one thing, if there's one thing I've kind of learned is I can't make sense of most of the stuff our government does. <laughs> you know, it's never, it's never always with the most common sense or the best intention. So I have no idea what will end up or what the landscape will finally be. But I promise you, once I see a solid direction things are going, we're going to do our, what we can to adjust and pivot. And if that means they shut mail order down completely, well, guess what? We'll find a way to survive. We survived before mail order because that's my mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I was worried that that kind of move is going to devastate my world, I won't be able to come over it. Well, then I got bigger problems. So, you know, it would be a pivot. It'd be a pivot my company would make. And now instead of looking more nationally, we focus more locally and, and, and getting market share locally and maybe building more locations. And that might be how the direction that we tend to move in. You know, and if God forbid the whole tobacco industry got banned tomorrow, well, I got a lot of inventory. We sell it and I go figure something else out to do. It's kind of been always the way I, I've lived my life. Mm -hmm. I can't worry about what I don't know. That's I, I. I was taking notes. I don't know if you can see me or. or, <laughs> or how that, I was. I was taking notes. I already have a page of notes <laughs> because you. You and and my notes are just like reflective points that could potentially change my point of view. Uh, and thank you for correcting me on that. The online thing because you know I, I'm like you know I, I up. Probably until today and probably still today. I'm like you got to have some sort of online presence But the execution factor Might have been something that maybe that Scott shop owner the smaller one might not be able to handle and that could be possibly Some of the gap that I've been you know 
some of the resistance I've been getting and all well, that. So an online store isn't something you do once. It's a thriving, ongoing thing that requires constant, constant. You know, yeah. it, it, it was like, hey, listen, I got to spend X number of dollars. I built this thing. I got the store. It runs itself. That's a different scenario, but it's not. It's a continual, ongoing commitment, uh, a commitment like a child. And some people may not have the aptitude or the resources for that. So that's not a real legitimate answer for them. It just wastes some resource. And, and listen, you've all seen it. You've all gone to somebody's website and you could tell no one's done anything to this site in 15 years. <laughs> sure. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they started oh, it with all this vigor and we're going to make a website. And we're going to do this. And somewhere along the way, they realized, ah, oh, forget that, man. Whatever it is, it is, it's up. We're not doing nothing to it. No one's touched it for like a decade. Yeah. So we've seen that so that that's that's why i don't like to have like broad solutions for everybody like this is the everybody's solution to a problem because it's not always the case well personally you've given me a lot of points to reflect on so i thank you for that adam you have a question uh actually to be honest i'm kind of a little starstruck right now so if you want to go over to drew i got a formula question i got a formula i'm like you know i was going to be selfish and just have it one-on-one -on -one, but i couldn't like you know. i would have been perfectly okay with that by the way because <laughs> like i can look i can speak to this guy for for like you know i think they did a marathon well, somebody did like a 26 hour man i could literally like bounce stuff off of you forever <laughs> oh, yeah. uh drew go yeah no just to like what abe is just it's, saying i mean it, it's 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 having the, the solutions execution i mean that just to me that's what i tell everybody every day in production meetings i'm here at my day job it's like it's not these challenges are very you know in like in the cigar industry like our our challenge during COVID was just how are we going to get our products to our customers locally and that's all we focused on and everybody you know and we did go to the online we we hired some people, they came in, they skewed, you know, they built our online presence and now it's about managing it. And I, I don't have the bandwidth to manage it. I know nobody doesn't have the bandwidth to manage it. So now, you know, we've done something, but now that something is just going to wither and, you know, uh, because it hasn't gotten attention from us, but, um, it is a lot to think about as a, as a, as a, as a shop owner um you know along those lines um i know for sure when we did the curb service uh we did exactly like what y'all did with the zoom uh kind of community thing and we had not only that we had i deliver cigars and, you know our friends you know a, a service but we also had like some of the guys in the zoom community were like hey you know what i can drop that off to johnny because i live like two blocks over from him and so that, that uh carter martyry would, would would develop and then next thing i know i hear that those guys were you know they ended up going in their backyard and just smoking the cigars together over there and so that in itself you know we learned to you know pivot to our people and and and, and understand geographically geographically where they were on the map around our other customers and we asked them hey you know so and so you don't mind dropping this off to them do you nah, 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 no problem and so and it's pretty cool so it it has uh you know the opportunity during COVID has really helped people understand the bigger thing um that we we, we like being around each other <laughs> you know we like uh you know that's why we go to the lounge we go there and we we commiserate and talk and hang out watch sports and whatnot and so now um but that you know to what Abe was saying i'm kind of I'm not landing the plane right now, but land the plane, Drew. Uh, I have like 16 more <laughs> questions and only time for four. So land the plane. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna land it right now. But like I said, you. you know, like you said, like you said, just the solutions were there. They were always there. Uh, there was no, you know, coming out of the comfort zone. It was just taking that, pivot it, and move forward. So there you go. Kudos to uh, you. Yeah. Uh, but the great smoke. I want. I want to. I want to hear exactly, more about that. That's exactly. That's what I, I was want to going. get into. That's exactly where smoke. I was going next. Yep. The great smoke. Yep. The Go great ahead, smoke. Drew. Ask oh. a question. <laughs> no, I just want to know how. You know how. You know when was that started? When was that developed? What developed it? I mean, I understand. You know, like with like with some of the other uh, events people have, but like uh, yeah, just want to know more about that. The great smoke started 15 years ago 
And how it started was, obviously, everybody knew the other big event that was done by a major magazine. Mm-hmm. And they had, they had one here in South Florida in 11 years. And it was actually Eric Espinosa who had come to me and wanted to figure out something to do in South Florida here. And yeah. we couldn't find any venue that would let us smoke. It was just terrible here. and couldn't figure anything out. I don't know what happened, but it was about a year later. It was after my 10th anniversary. I'm looking at this courtyard, the same courtyard. Drew, uh, uh, the same courtyard, uh, Joe, where you had the your your podcast, where you did the podcast, that whole courtyard there. Yep. I'm like, man, I could just take this over and do a, like a mini event here. Yeah. We had our first event was thirty <laughs> companies in that whole courtyard. We took it all over, and and that's how it started. And then you know, it, it, it was crazy how successful that first one was. I mean, it was only like you know maybe three hundred and some people there the first time, but for Nobody really knowing what I was doing or whatever. It was re- really, really great. And it just kept growing. We kept outgrowing venues and expanding. And part of the reasons why the success, and, and this has kind of been our philosophy to our whole company, is a lot of manufacturers, even here in Florida, have tried to emulate the event or do their version of the event. And if you look at something like that and your intention is how do i make a lot of money doing this it typically will fail my greatest successes in life is why i didn't worry about the money i worried about what my goal was that i wanted to achieve and the money always worked itself out so the first year first two years i know for a fact we lost money doing the event because my focus the first two years was how do I make something that everybody's going to talk about for the next six months? So our, our great smoke event has always been experience driven. And that's why it's gone from 300 to 3000 people from a four hour event to now a four day event to mm-hmm. where just a bunch of my regulars to people flying in from overseas and all over the country to come to the event. So, you know, in year three, I think we broke even or we made a few bucks and it just kept growing. And that's how I attacked it this year doing it digitally was, I mean, I, I really didn't care what anything costed because I knew what I was attempting was so off the wall, so historic that many of my peers and competitors in the industry sent me texts the next morning messages saying, what you did was amazing. It was, you all, they actually called me the pioneer in how events will be done. Gravity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I knew it was so nuts that it can't fail. Mm-hmm. So you can't sit here and worry about how much we're going to spend on the set or whatever, because if you blow it the first time out of the gate, um, it's it's done. So we we really focused on how do we take something that that's always been experience driven. Right, people come in, they gather, they socialize a bit, and how am I going to do this digitally? And this was a big problem for us because if I couldn't find a way to try to somehow make this somewhat of an epic experience still because it's very hard look at our flat screens there's no excitement it's very hard how do we do this then we're just not going to do it because i don't want to tarnish the 14 years we'd already did in building up this great thing and um i had seen a couple of some events that some other major companies did and look they sold a package and then a bunch of guys got on like we are now and talking for me that's not an event mm-hmm. right you know because their focus was how many of these cigar packs can we sell that we normally sell every year? They weren't focused on the secondary product, which for me is always the most important part, the event part. The content, right. Yeah, the content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what content. keeps them coming back. That's what keeps them talking. No one's ever walked out of any one of my stores and said, man, that was the best Padron I've ever smoked. That was way better than the Padron I smoked at that shop. Or that. <laughs> no one's ever done that. It's the same cigar. I mean, unless they got a crap humidor, it's dry. But if the cigars are taken care of, and it's a normal humidor. No one's ever walked out of my store reading about the cigar. You know, I mean, if it's something rare, limited, yeah, fine. But for ninety five percent of the stuff, it's the same stuff. But they will walk out of the store talking about how great they were treated, and how awesome their experience was, how clean the store was, how clean the bathroom was. All that stuff is what makes the difference in the, the day. So. We didn't know what to do. We were mind boggled. And I literally made a joke. I like to do these think tank sessions like we did with, with the zoning commissioner trying to find somebody. I like to bring four or five guys on my team and we just sit here in this office and we just start throwing stuff. And um, I said, wouldn't it be cool if we did like a Jerry Lewis 
style, like variety show, tonight show, telephone. I mean, it would, be, it would be, my actual intention was to have fake can callers where we, we'd walk over as people were calling in doing fake orders. You know, we had this whole like, you know, and then you know, you got to come down to reality a little bit and what you can actually execute. But, um, and I, I just said it like goofingly, funnily stupid. We have no TV production, no, no experience and stuff. And my operation guy out of the blue goes, you know, like my best friend for like 25, 30 years owns a company. That's what he does for a living. He's done the Golden Globes. I'm like, really? I said, well, why don't you give a call? And he called him. The guy's like, oh, I love this. Yeah, I'll fly down here. I'm like, uh, you know, just so you know, you know, we're not like a Hollywood production company. We're not trying to sell a show to Netflix, you know. And like, no, 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 dude, this is great. And, you know, Matt's family will work with you and whatever. And, and, and then they just took off. Mm-hmm. How we got this variety show, we got this set, we got entertainers, I got manufacturers who committed to making special cigars, and we and and, and, and we wanted to incorporate a live audience. So, you know, in the end and, and the success was there. It was there. We created a lot of love, a lot of excitement. We had so many emails. We had emails from people who said, you know, we see these events every year, whether it be in New York or Vegas or Florida, and we're just not the type of people that can take that time, kind of time off for work or to be able to get an airline ticket and come down. And it, this was the first, me- and it was the most beautiful thing ever. We hope you do it every year. And we've got hundreds of those kind of emails. So I knew because of the technical side, we had to pay $4,000 for one day of high speed internet mm-hmm. okay, broadcast. So we- I knew this was either going to be an epic success or an epic fail because of technical things yes. you know i mean the amount of equipment they bought in and set up in two days i i really felt like okay so when's the shuttle going to the moon i mean <laughs> yeah. like what is going on in here and um we you know we pulled it off and uh and because of it now because of what we learned and from what the feedback we've gotten from people all over the country um we're doing a hybrid version in 2022 and i think we're gonna pull something off historic i mean my, my team literally the week after was sitting here how do we Incorporate virtual and live. How can we do this? And we were, and, and there was there was some parts of it that we just couldn't get around. And then, like a week later, we actually came up with a good idea, and the manufacturers kind of liked it. So, 2022, which is going to be Hawaiian theme, we're going to call it the Last Luau, um, will be a physical event that's hybrid with virtual for those who can't make it. And there will be a small studio set up, and it's going to go back and forth from the studio to the live event. And I think we got a great way on how we're going to incorporate it and attack it in 2022. That's awesome. Uh, we can relate uh, in a pre-COVID era for uh, the Security Weekly Network. We would travel into you know big security conferences and take in all the security podcast content on the road, and we ship gear like you know a, 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 Mac, a Mac truck comes and like we ship the gear before we all fly out. And then we all fly out and meet the gear. And then Johnny, who you met, who does uh, our audio and video production here with Goose, go there and set it all up. It's great for me and Paul because we get to Vegas and we go to um, cause the uh, the Fuentes. no the uh, the Davidoff uh, Lounge, or we'll oh, go yeah. to Casa Fuente and stuff like that. And Johnny's like setting up for like eight hours after we land. You know, <laughs> and Paul and I are coming home, stumbling drunk to the hotel room, and Johnny's still at the freaking thing setting it all up. So, and, and 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 the money that it costs to send that and do that, and we used to do that on a once a month basis on average for four days. We'd fly, you know, Vegas, Florida, blah blah blah, everywhere. And and do that, and it's no easy feat. But I think that if you can incorporate that, it's just it's because you know it does give that person the opportunity to um, there. And I also think that it was a perfect storm too with COVID for you to successfully launch that. I mean, you can always tell on social media like which cigar event is going to do well because when you scroll down in your feed like you you see like all that and and when it was your week in February it was like I couldn't get through a scroll or two without having someone chime in about your event you know well, there's a couple problems there one is when you're doing something that's never been done before it's hard for people to get a visual what do you mean you're doing a 7 hour virtual event what am I going to do for 7 hours right mm-hmm. so 
that's part of the battle. And I, I know because of my history, some of these manufacturers, like they didn't even listen to my pitch. They just, because of my history, like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're involved. Like, no, let me explain to you what I want to do. Yeah. All right. Get, they had no, they, no idea. what sure. we're doing, sure. You know, <laughs> so that that's part of the problem. So that's why we, we made, we made renderings of what the studio was going to look like because I had nothing. To, now, next year, it's easier. I got video footage, I got, but we had nothing. So I had to actually pay a woman to make renderings of what we knew the studio was probably going to look like so that we could show people our commitment to what we we're building. It's not just going to be like I'm sitting at my desk now doing a virtual event, you know? So there's always that battle. And then there's just always the non tangibility of it. Like we had the party in the boxes that were, everything was pictured since last December, November, even what they were going to get, what, what was coming in it, what the value, what the price was. It wasn't even a secret. We even listed all the cigars that were included right on the website. And by the time the first or second week of February came around, we we kind of anticipated like, okay, everybody's everybody's kind of who wants to do this has kind of made a decision by now and they're going to do it. You know, there's not going to be like walk-up people. Like every year when you do the physical event, there's probably 150 to 200 walk-ups that day who didn't buy tickets. There's no walk up for this virtual event. So we kind of did. Then these packages started landing everywhere. And now that people started seeing it, seeing the post, we got surged. We got surged with everybody with la these last minute ticket. We had to shut it off because we got to the point where we knew we couldn't fulfill getting those packages out where it would come in any relevant time before the event. Mm -hmm. So it, it became a little crazy, but it's, it's always when you're doing the first time that it becomes harder to do the same. Like, if I had known two months prior to the event what we were going to go through, what it was going to take to pull it off and do it, I literally would have hired a documentary crew just to walk around and film it, everything we were doing and going through. Um, but to do it again would literally be less than half as hard sure. now. Right. So so now for us to find a way, and, and, and then we did find a way that we're going to make this 2022 version the most rocking live event you could ever go to and if you don't come down here at home we're going to put on a show that's going to be probably one of the coolest things that people at home will be able to watch and still somewhat feel involved and participate in what's going on live at the moment that's awesome yeah it's super cool uh, uh, you know uh abe i want to respect your time can i have you for another 10 minutes Did yeah you you're, good. you're good okay you're good, cool. bro. all right awesome uh wanna wanna pivot if we can unless adam do you have a question yet or no it's uh it's kind of tough because I do have a question. Just for ask him. the freaking question. Okay, fine then. So this is one of those cool rapid I know, response I know, videos. I, I want to cram but as much as I can. <laughs> in. Go. Well, I gotta know, Abe. Okay, it's just like listening to you over the past like forty-five minutes and whatnot, and understanding who you are, um, and like your history and everything else like that. The one thing I gotta ask is listening to the event, listening to the come up and everything else like that. Where does the, where does the commitment, loyalty, and just overall faith in what you're doing? And what you have, like this virtual event you went to, like where does that faith that like it's gonna be a failure or it's gonna be a success, where does that come from? I just gotta I, know because this is a level of dedication and love for something that just I, seems I, outstanding. I just think that's something that's instilled from you at a young age. Hmm. Um, you know, I had a very, I had an immigrant father who was a very hard worker. There wasn't things that like you know he said he couldn't do. But I think it's a mentality you grow up in. I was very athletic and played a lot of sports growing up. And I could be one point away from losing a game. And I'm not kidding you. There, there was no part in my brain that thought I was going to lose a game. Mm. I mean, it's happened all the time, you know, because that's just the way I feel. And if I lose, I lose. Mm. But I, there's never the moment where I accept the defeat until it's actually happened. Um, and it's funny because... That's the way I attack every project. Like, there's no room for failure, but I can accept the failure because it happens. Because when I was freaking out about the great smoke, um, you know, my wife's always reassuring me and saying, babe, everything you do comes out right. Don't worry about it. You know, it's a yeah, yeah, big hit. And I literally got to tell her, babe, no, I've had a couple bad hits. We just forget them and bury them. And, <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. And this could be one of those. So, um, but I think if you open yourself to the door that, hey, this could go wrong. So then you try to think of everything that goes wrong. You you pretty much ensure your better opportunity for success. So I, I, I'll give you a point of how insane, insane I am sometimes. So Michael Herklotz flies in Friday. 
you know, one of the hardest things about this was this was live. So there was no dress rehearsal. There was no script. There was no walkthrough. I mean, like people showed up Friday, Saturday morning, we started. So Michael comes in Friday. He meets us at the place. He's hungry. I said, let's go get some lunch. We go to lunch. We go to this great Greek restaurant, not too far from where we built the studio. And I order, and I'm in a Greek restaurant. I order octopus salad. Michael Harcloth goes, I'll take one of those. Now the waiter walks away, and now my head starts saying, I, said, well, I mean, this is a great restaurant, but it is octopus. You know, <laughs> I watch a lot of kitchen nightmares. I literally said to Mike, I said, do you think it's a good idea we both order the same lunch? And he's looking at me, and he's like, yeah, yeah. You know, if we get food poisoned, we're screwed. <laughs> sure. You know, both of us just ate the same thing. Yep. I mean, the show could have went on with one of us. Yep, right, right. Mm -hmm. But if we both get food poisoned right now, we are screwed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the kind of crap that my head deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think that drive, that commitment, I, I, I don't think it's something that, it, it, I mean, maybe it is taught. You know, it was taught to me by seeing it, seeing my father do it. Um, and I think it's something that gets instilled in people at a young age, and, and no matter what they do. I mean, look, one of my college jobs was Papa John's Pizza, all right? And that was before, like, I think it was national, because I had never heard of it, so I went to Indiana University. But let me tell you something. Every pizza I made looked like the ad that came out of the, uh, on TV. No. My roommates would love me. They were pretty. The pepperonis were symmetrical. I mean, that's how I just attacked everything. I, you know, I, I've done. I mean, if I'm going to waste my effort and time to make a pizza, I'm going to make it a damn good looking pretty pizza. So, you know, I think it's just something that's taught at a young age to people and, and it, it, it grows as you get older and mature. Yeah, I, I try to instill that in my son now that he's uh, almost three and he's doing his chores and whatnot and, and, and trying to instill that. You know what I mean? And, 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 I, and I struggle with it with my four kids because they're all different. I was helping my. 13 year old do this i don't know this presentation and i'm like hey, but you see how all your graphics aren't the same size why don't you crop them out you know make them all so that it looks nicer and it's like a simple thing but it's pride and like in her brain she's like why does it make a difference like, no <laughs> no it does all the little things make a difference so but then i got another girl who's ocd psychopathic so i got I, you know she's psychotic so i have to you know, tone her down a little bit. So they're all different, but yeah. you know, you, mm -hmm. you try to put them on the best course you can. Yeah, I'm so excited to meet my second son because I wonder what his personality is going to be like. You know what I mean? Dude, I'm like, telling you. It's going to be different, I'm sure. <laughs> I got four kids, completely different, you know? <laughs> you know. Something else. Yeah, it's like, because I, I mean, our first son, I mean, oh, I'm just like, I'm in love, right? And then, like, my second one, I'm like, well, you know, and, and and now, you know, me and my wife talking about that, like, freaking, like, you know, like, like, you know, are, are we, are, are, you know, what do you think it's going to be like? And we're getting, we're, we're getting to be that excited part, especially like we're eight days away, right? You start to ask yourself, yeah. can you possibly love another baby like you did the first one? Right, right, right. And she went That's through. That's what I was. I'm like, I love my first daughter so much. <laughs> How am I going to love the second daughter? Right. And you end right. up doing it anyway. Yeah. I mean, my, my brother actually asked me, because he's got two boys, do you ever say to yourself that you like one more than the other? <laughs> I, said, well, I said, well, yeah, at any given moment, that might be true. But, <laughs> sure. but no, because they're all so different. I love them all so much in different ways. They yeah. all provide some different level of love that's different from each and every other one of them. I know which one will take care of me if I end up old in a retirement home. I can tell you right now. Okay, that's the oldest. That's the oldest. Yep. I, I know the one that will call me the least and be the most independent out of them, you know? The son will be a soldier to the death in my right arm. I mean, it, they did all have different things. So um, it's interesting. And I, I'm kind of a little bit envious of the journey now that you're on because, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we kept having babies is that you get to that point where, Oh, that phase is over. We're never going to have it again. Mm. Well, yeah, we, can, we just make another baby, you know. So, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm envious of where you're, where you're, where you're, where you're, where you're at right now. So, uh, it, you you have some wonderful times ahead. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to pivot and talk a little bit about KMA Radio because I have an episode uh, of yours from listening, and I think it was in the early days where <laughs> where you actually interviewed and i'm having a brain fart because my brain can't just consume exactly who it was 
but you interviewed an MMA fighter. And at the time, I had made my, in 2004, my boxing trainer died. I got into uh, uh, all different martial arts and then MMA was, was coming about. And so I left boxing and I'm back boxing now. But anyway, uh, you know, and, and, and you interviewed an MMA fighter. And I'm like, this guy, like Abe, like you get it. Like here you, here's an MMA fighter on a cigar show and you just turned, you, to me, the show kind of pivoted. And and that's one of the things like I like here on Story Geeks. I mean, we've talked about ashtrays, we've talked about I mean random stuff that had nothing to do with cigars as well. But you interviewed this MMA fighter. Do you remember it was an up and coming MMA guy? He came in studio. Uh, you know, he had his first M uh, debut. Uh, is this striking a bell with you or no? No. No. Okay. I don't it was remember. you. So it was you. I don't know. I know we had a boxer on. I know we've had a couple boxers on, actually. Yeah. Um, we had a couple boxers on. Everybody, I, I, you know, 10 years, man. It's been a long Yeah, I know. I know. I don't know how far back you're going. But, but that was one of the things I wanted to do when we went into this. Look, I'm not a reviewer, so we're not going to do cigar reviews. I'm not really news. And we struggled in the beginning to find our identity because we tried to be a little bit of everything. We had a little political segment. We had to, and, and in, the, in the early years, we really struggled to find an identity of what the show was really about because I was trying to cram everything into a bag because my my initial thing was I wanted to reenact what happens in a cigar lounge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get together with guys, and when you get together, with guys, you talk about everything. Sure, it can be family, it can be wife, kids, and we really struggled early on. And then uh, when we got Paul as our producer, as much as I bust on his chops, Paul helped level out a few things and. Um, I think I'm most proud of where the KMA is right now today, which is, you know, another thing that has been part of my career, whether it's the great smoke or my shops or KMA, we, we never get stagnant. We never say this is where it's at. It's a continual push on how does it get better? Yep. What makes it a little bit better? What can I do with the great smoke this year so that it's different from last year to make it better? And you know, at first, it was all about different attractions. We had bull rides. We had dunk tanks. Because, like I said, my event's always experience-driven. And then we came up accidentally the year before COVID. It was, it was really because ac we always themed the printing, whether it be earth stuff like woods or steel or fire. There was always a theme for the tickets and the lanyards. And they had made the poster, and it was like, it, it looked like outer space. It was like in stars or something. And then I saw it, and it looked like a disco ball. I said, man, this, this, this kind of looks like a disco ball here in the middle. Oh. <laughs> and that's literally how we, that's literally what my face did. I'm like, oh, why don't we do a 70s disco? And that was the first year, 2019 was the first year we themed the event. And then, you know, we, we announced it at the end of 2019 and 2020, we were going to do the Hawaiian, you know, themed event. And, and it obviously never happened. We saved it for this year. But now with the adding of themes, it makes it even easier to make every year different from the last year. We're going to have girls in hula skirts, fire dancers, you know, pig, a whole pig row. So it's even made it easier now to say, hey, every year when you come to the Great Smoke, it's going to be a completely different experience. Mm. And it's not about me trying to think of, oh, do we get the bull? Do we get the thunk tank? Do we get this? Do we get that? And um, it's actually made it easier. But whether it's KMA or whether it's, we, we constantly, so right now where KMA is at, even though we don't have a studio, which is, I always like, I like having a different camera angles and perspective and Paul's still at home and I do it from here and our guests come from wherever. Um, I like the value of where the production has gotten. I think the show looks great. It mm -hmm. sounds great. The content and the way we it flows out and the, 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 the cadence of the show is great. And I, yeah, I'm very, very proud and happy where KMA has gotten to today. Yeah. It, it's, it's certainly grown and it's one of those, um, I I listen to, uh, and it's it's like I said when like when when I listened when I first started the concept I was working for a radio station there and, and I was putting together other shows I put together a wine show on like a like a soft easy rock it was called light light rock one hundred five here you know like the kind of you know the 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 ob above forty five crowd and I put together yeah. a wine dinner and this and I was building all these shows. And, and, and the executive producer was like, well, why don't you, you should do, you know, you should do a cigar show. And I'm like, I, on the radio? I'm like, I, you think that's going to be good? He's like, I think that would be good. And he goes, we'll do it Friday 
4 to 6 p.m. drive and 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 do that there and then you know it got podcasted because you know terrestrial works that way they throw it all on podcast because they're trying to get into that and i put it together and i was like this is a mate like and 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 i completely loved it you know what i mean and then obviously raised attention and 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 paul heard about me from from when he was with with story geeks not he's not with story geeks but you know what i mean and right whatnot. and then it led to that and he was like would you ever leave scott club radio I go, well, as a matter of fact uh it's it's outgrown its sponsorship i was thinking about switching it to the business roundtable because there was a lot of businesses that wouldn't sponsor the show because because of the the tobacco and this and that so yeah i'm like totally so then i did both and like i completely loved it i was able to come here and do story geeks and then go back on terrestrial radio and do my show and and and, and it was so cool and then you know seeing where it grows but you know you bring up a lot of common points right of like which show you know the the content of the show and you want to critique it or you want to you know uh m make sure listeners and what i like about the podcast is like the, the numbers don't lie right when i look right. at the story geeks numbers uh post exodus from the regular host like the numbers went up you know what i mean which is why it's still around obviously right, right. it's just like the radio days and i'm like well this is crazy i'm like well people like you know and and then people started interacting with me and you know after i got like a year and a half of where's where's paul and where's will right <laughs> i'm like uh here's will's website and i still work with paul and then like even story geeks listeners are like you know you get to have a cigar with with with, with, with paul every day what's that like i'm like hey it's cool like you know what I mean? like you know <laughs> you know but believe me i'm not talking about paul about cigars we're talking about security because that's like his gig you know right and and it, it's so cool but but seeing your show and then how how it's it's grown uh there and yeah. and the presence that it has it's super cool uh, i just want to say like when i was putting my model together you were one of my uh influencers uh no, in, that, you, in in that I'm, look we my goal my number one goal every week because look for us to do it and my team it's a commitment every saturday yes so it is. You really got to want to be there so the number one goal and for anybody who's taking two hours of their saturday morning or afternoon to join us we want to make sure it's fun yep. so entertaining entertaining is always our number one and if you learn a thing or two during the show even better but right. You know, we're, we're not we're not the ones you're gonna we're gonna teach you the depths of uh, different you know levels of tobacco on the plan that's not gonna be our show mm -hmm. we're gonna try to entertain you and if we can get you to chuckle two or three times during the show then we did our job yep yep absolutely yeah. uh let's do a last round robin of questions if if uh if we have them drew you've been kind of quiet Let, let's uh no i was just gonna I was going to say, I think I found that uh, episode you were talking about, episode 276 back in 2017, mm -hmm. with former Brock boxer Jameel McQueen. That's that was the boxer. Point. I know we had Jameel out. We had two boxers. Jameel was one, and we had um, uh, the the Hebrew Hammer, uh, Sheldon, uh, who used to train down here in West Palm Beach. He came on, and my favorite part is when he, uh, my old producer, uh, who used to, was, I guess, somewhat of a you know masochist, um, he took a gut punch from this guy. <laughs> yeah, he has been a regular on my show twice. Yeah. Yeah. You found yeah. the episode. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Drew. Like, yeah, I was yeah. like, I was like, wow, man. Like, you know, it just exposed. The, I was, I was so pumped. He was a boxer. I thought it was an MMA. Maybe I got punched in the head too many times. I don't yeah. know. Like, <laughs> former pro boxer on the, uh, I, the uh, well, and you end up taking long. a punch from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Drew, do you have a final question for uh, Abe? Yeah. No, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, I, I, it's kind of a question, but then it's also just uh, 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 an observance. But, yeah, Abe, I, I got to say, you know, it seems like family is really strong for you, uh, you know, and it's it's good to see uh, people <laughs> that, just, that make time for the family. Because everybody always asks, how do you have the bandwidth to work your day job, go to the cigar lounge, or do a cigar event? And then hang out with your wife or your grandson. I have grands. I have grandkids already. I'm I'm 52, so I got two grandkids. So uh, kids are growing up and they're they're having kids. Uh, but yeah, uh, the 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 I I think that's awesome. Uh, and you share that with every you know every, all your uh, your uh, people on Facebook and whatnot. So um, well, I'll tell you but, something about bandwidth. You want me to answer that question? I learned something yeah. my freshman year in college. Um, 
I was always a reader. I liked reading books. I had to read them during school, no choice. And, you know, we'd pick up a book every now and then. And I got into books really in my freshman year in college, or not. And that year in college, going to school, doing all the other things, I think I read 24, 26 novels that year. Okay. Like one of them I remember was The Once in the Future King by T.H. White, which was like a book that big, right? And, um, you want to know how, why that happened? It wasn't because I was trying to read books. I just had a book everywhere I went. If I was on a bus, get waiting for a bus, I'd read a book. If I was on a crap where I would read the book. If I was waiting in line in the cafeteria and it was a long line, I would just read and walk, read and walk. And I just, and it wasn't like it was an effort. I was like, man, I read a lot of stuff. I barely feel like I was, I ever stopped to say, hey, let me read a book. I just wouldn't have any idle time. And I think people don't realize how much time they waste. So, I'm very good with not wasting my idle time, even in just conversation. Sometimes I get agitated with my staff because they'll come in my office like, so, <laughs> uh, I'm like, whoa, we got to get to the point here, yeah. So um, it, it, you'd be surprised at how much more time you find in the day if you're conscious of not wasting time, whether it be, I, look, I, I, I work at red lights. I make most of my phone calls while I'm in the car. So that during the day I could work. I can tell people, I'm going to be in the car in 20 minutes. Let me call you back. Because that's something I could easily do while I'm driving. Um, when I'm at red lights, I might get on social media real quick. Da -da 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 -da, the red light, put it away, go. So I don't go in the bathroom without a phone, you know, to work on. So literally, I just optimize all this time that we have during the day that you just would be dead time doing nothing. You know, waiting at a red light, driving, whatever. You get a lot of crap done, which makes a lot more time for the other stuff, whether it be with your kids and your wife. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a chore, but it's not a job. That's where you want to be. You have to work because you got to feed the family. And you want to spend time with your wife and kids. And if you're good at it, you can manage to make everybody happy. You know, look, whether it's your work, whether it's your life, whether it's your health, um, everything just comes to some sort of a balance. If you can get the skills to somewhat level out and be close to where each other at, you're always going to be better off than when one's weighed down and the other's not getting anything. Yep. That, that's like Nelson Drew. He always asked me, like, you know, you got your business, you're doing the Security Weekly, you're preparing story geeks, you got some other ventures going on, this, that, and the other thing. How do you find the time? I'm like, dude, you remember when you asked me, like, how, uh, did you watch that movie or watch that series? I'm like, no. I'm like, how, you know, I'm like, I spend time with my son, like, we turn off the TV. And when we have dinner, and we try to have dinner like four times a week together, schedule sometimes, and sometimes it's five, but it's, it's a minimum of four, right? We put on the radio while we eat, or, or we'll be in silence while we eat, and we have dinner time and family time. You gotta turn off that damn TV. And don't, don't nope. just, uh, it's like four hours a night, yep. like four, and, and yep. then now, because my, because my kid, and soon my kids are younger, you know, he goes to bed at 8.30, 8.33, that computer's open, I'm looking for prospects for my business, or doing some excess security <laughs> weekly stuff, or into getting interviews prepped for Story Geeks, like, you know, you're prepping that time, you know, you're prepping that time, so, you know. You, you, Sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't on mute. Sorry that's okay. That. There's no idle. You know what I mean? You just can't be idle. You got to keep moving and and keep going because, uh, you know, even if you're here for 88, 99 years, that's still not a long time. You know what I no. mean? And, and, and quite frankly, I have a list personally, and I'm sure we all do, of stuff we didn't even accomplish yet. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't have enough time in this world to do that. You know? But, so, but I, I also don't sleep pretty much more than five hours a night. Mm. I, I'm, usually, I'm, I'm usually in bed by one in the morning between 12 and one. And I'm usually up at six every day with my kids, but that's enough for me. I mean, not everybody can function like that. For me, that's prime operating yeah. feature. But look, even with employees, I try to not be efficient. Don't waste time. So, so, you know, probably in the last 10 years of my life, I've probably filled up my own gas tank like a dozen times because I got employees who borrow my car regularly. They're dropping some off. They're doing it. Oh, say, hey, fill it up while you're out. Right. Fill it up while you're out. <laughs> I'm not. Because for me, that's an utter waste of time. Yep. I got to pull the gas either. That, that, that's like 15 minutes of my time. I'm doing nothing. Right. But I will think like that. You're already going out. You're taking my car. Do me a favor. Fill that tank up while you're out there. Literally, I, have, I, I, I barely ever filled up my gas tank. But I will do that with a lot of menial tasks during the day. That just will stack up on top of something else. If you could just think about it, and it frees up a lot of time in your day, believe it or not. Yeah, that's good advice. That's good mm -hmm. advice. Adam, 
Question or comment? Uh, no, I got nothing. Well, actually, just a comment real quick. It's um, because I could I could spend like hours talking to you. By the way, right? You know, <laughs> re- like you know, it's just I got so many questions. Well, just for freaking you. ask them. No, we don't got the time. So just anyway, ask a question. Well, What's I got on one. I got one question. Does okay. Matthew Briggs r- ring a bell for you? <gasps> Matthew Briggs. He, he's my operations manager. Oh yeah, his uh, what was that? I think his nephew. It's I used to work at Cigar Masters in Providence. I just want to get this out of the way. It was um, I worked at Cigar Masters in Providence, and it was uh, this guy comes walking in from New York, and I end up talking to him, getting really close, all this other stuff. He's his nephew of uh, Matthew Briggs, and it was interesting because I have never been to one of your spots, but I am so excited to go to one of your spots because of the stories I have heard through the uncle, through Zach, and stuff like that. Nothing but great things, you know, saying about it. I just really appreciate you taking the time out of here. You know, out of your day because it's like the way you think and whatnot to do this. I really appreciate it, and that's all I gotta oh, say. Man, uh, I appreciate it. It's my honor being here. And Matt is actually the guy who knew the sh- the production company that did the Great Smoke. Oh no way! So, huh? oh. Yeah, yeah, that was the guy I was talking about. He's my operations guy, and um, Matt walked off the street looking for. I mean, he, 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 he the company he worked for for seventeen years had, had stopped. Uh, his wife had a full time job, but he was sick of being at home. Literally walked in off the street, didn't even know we we're hiring, looked for an application. We started Matt out as a floor guy, simple floor guy. And I think within two years, maybe three years, he was ba- he's basically running most of anything that has to do with the retail end of the shore. Mm. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite shop? Don't worry, it's only three of us listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to say that. Like, you know. no, well, I mean, look, I mean, look. <laughs> Because they're all different. I've only been to two, uh, so the, 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 they really, they really all are all different. Everybody thinks that oh, the Boynton Beach is my favorite shop because this is where my office is and my headquarters. But when we built this, this is the only one that could ever really have a real office. It was our biggest store at the time when we built the store. Um, you know, they all provide something differently. Like I just had to leave the shopping center where our first location was yeah. for twenty five years because of a lawsuit with a landlord mm-hmm. and. I really didn't think about it because you're so caught up with moving it and getting it out in time, whatever. And as I emptied it out, look at it, it really kind of hit me in the gut. Like, man, I've been in the center for 25 years serving it. And now I was walk, I was locking that door for the last time. Yeah. For the last time. Yeah. And I had to, but I, I, I don't dwell on that kind of stuff. I felt it. I, I appreciated the moment. And then I was excited for the new shop and the next new shop. So, um, yeah, I don't really think I have a favorite shop other than the fact of this one may be considered my favorite because it's where I'm at all day and the convenience of being here. I think they all have unique qualities of what makes them special and different from the other shops because anybody will tell you every shop has its own kind of subculture that's distinctive and definitive to that group in that shop. Mm-hmm. I asked the same question. There's a local guy here who owns three shops here in Rhode Island. And I'm like, well, which one's your favorite? And he's like, ah, I'll tell you when the customers leave. <laughs> okay, it's not this one. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they all have their own internal people who frequent. And, it's a lot and, easier to ask which one do you, that gives you the most grief. Because that's the one that, you know, you get that one store for whatever reason. And everything's going wrong. And the AC is always breaking every week. or this. <laughs> And that one's your not favorite store for sure. Sure, right, right. Uh, the the point was, Adam. I recommend the one over in West Palm. In West Palm, you can spend the day. You can spend the day. I spent the day there. I'll tell you more about it. Like when you know, because I don't. Yo, want to. I, I hate to break it to you. You wouldn't even recognize it. Oh really? Oh, I'm going back. Well, I'm actually Yo, going back in September. So well, make sure you hit me up, but you won't recognize it. It's it's. It's around the corner for where it used to be. Mm-hmm. But it's and in that same plaza? That same, same plaza, literally like yep. 20, 30 yards from where it was. Okay. But it's a full bar now. Mm-hmm. It's, got, it's a, a, one of the probably nicest outdoor patios you'll ever see mm-hmm. yeah. in the country. And But, but you know, shops like, like people evolve, mm-hmm. especially when you're doing something 25 years. You know, the group... You know, I go back to a shop sometimes. I don't recognize the, like, the people anymore because they've all changed. Some have died, some have passed away. Um, but they evolve and they progress. The only thing you could hope for as an owner is it just stays on the right path, no matter where it evolves to, it progresses. That you, you create this culture where everybody feels like family and they get along and they realize that we, we all share this common passion. We celebrate it together. And that's all you can ask for. But 
and, you know, things change and they evolve. I've seen it in my own stores. I mean, literally. So it, it's kind of a dynamic thing that you never want to be blind to and always kind of just kind of like your children worry about, think about, keep your eye on it and, and hope it goes the way you want it to go. Mm-hmm. Um, that that that's it, it's so true. I I get asked a lot of the questions like, you know, well, would you open up another cigar shop? I'm like, hell yeah. I'm like, not in Northeast, but hell yeah. <laughs> I was like, hell, absolutely. I, I would, you know, whether it be a kiosk or something or there. And 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 I always say to myself, uh, and I kind of want to wrap this up and how it relates to you with with the 25 years. I will always do a cigar podcast, something or other whether it be this platform or another platform in the future or whatever, because I absolutely, completely love the opportunities that the premium cigar industry has provided me for well over 24 years that I've been involved. I mean, I was a rep at one point, and I was like, don't like the road, don't like the... I don't like your cigar or like your cigar, but back or blah, 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 all that stuff, right? Uh, I owned a retail shop, I it, which became another bigger retail shop from there, and they were moving, and I was just like, I'm out of the acquisition. So there you go. And, you know, I, I've I've done the, the Cigar Club Radio. I, I, like, I always have a platform there. So my question to you is 25 years you've been at that. When did you first like say i'm going to be starting this journey like take us through if you can wrap up that show like what how did you start with either with be your first retail or when did you make pull that trigger and what did you do for work before that you pulled well, the trigger i was in the family business which was the grocery business it was your chicago. family business in chicago right yeah what happened, what happened was i had my own graphics believe it or not back then graphics company and i was doing it out of college um, I was running out of the basement of my family's house. I was mm-hmm. doing well. I, I was doing so well. I used to drive my father nuts because I had this product I developed. I would go out and I was 22, you know, I don't know, you know, I'd go out and sell it. It'd be a big sale. And I didn't have to work for three weeks. And I'd go partying and drinking or whatever. And <laughs> make account got low. I'd go out and get another job. That drove him nuts. Because you could you always know, find that, money on the streets then. Now, God, I like, those not a, days. <laughs> he's like, that's not a job. What, what is that? You know? And, and it's really funny because I look back at it. And my dad had just grabbed me and said, you don't realize how good this is. You need to get some salespeople on the streets. Selling you need to get out of this basement. Because it could have really been huge. Um, but I was 22. Didn't know anybody. I was happy to make a lot of money and go waste it and spend it and party and drink and then run out of money and go make it some more. So he forced me, he goes, dude, you ain't working most of the week. You're going to come work in, 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 in the grocery store. I'm like, all right, whatever. And just like anything else, like the Papa John's pizza, I came to the store. I started making it better. I wanted to make signs. I was marketing. I was just doing everything that I would normally do. Like it was, you know, important. And then next thing I know, my dad was partners with my uncle. He wanted to retire. Next thing I knew, I'm my dad's partner. I'm running the family business. Uh, literally just thrown at me. And I had gotten into cigars and I gotten into cigars to the point I got un- my, one of my uncles knew I was in a cigar says, Hey, look, people are coming in our, this is like right around the boom. People are coming into our store, always asking about cigars. We know you smoke cigars. Can you put something in here for us? Yeah. I know a guy who's, who's got a cigar distribution. Let me go see him. He'll sell to me. And, and, and the guy ended up selling to me. I didn't even have a tobacco license at the time. Literally I just buy it cash. And I ordered this six foot humidor. I filled it all up and I said, all right, uncle. You're good to go. Call me about five or six months if you need some more. I'll help you out. Dude calls me back a week later. Says it's gone. I said what's gone? He's like the humidor. I'm like who took it? Says no, all the cigars are gone. I said what? <laughs> <laughs> it was like a week. And then that's when a bell went off my head. Man, I should like start putting these things everywhere. And that's what I did. At one point, I think I had 40, 40, 50 accounts all over Chicago, country, cut anywhere I'd go. Here's my deal, man. You should sell yeah. cigars. This is a great bar. This is a great. Bar. Oh, I don't know nothing about cigars. You don't have to. You tell me how much floor space you want to give me, three, four, five, six, eight feet. I'll bring the humidor in. You don't pay for it. I will fill it up. You don't pay for it. At the end of the month, I'll come. We'll do an inventory. You keep 20%. You give me the rest of the money. And I just started opening them up. And that's kind of how I got in the cigar business. And then one of my friends who was here in Florida who was getting a cigar business wanted me to come down and do it with him. And I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of tied up here. I just took over the family business. I got the cigar thing going up here. But why don't we do a retail shop up here in Illinois? So I started looking there. 
And then because I was doing so well in the grocery business, the co-op actually had this other big store that was a competitor of ours for years. I knew about way bigger than us. For whatever reason, they mismanaged. Something happened. They owed the co-op money. So the co-op, you know, kind of like um, repoed the store back. And they said, hey, you want this store. So what do you mean you want this store? Said, well, we don't want it. They didn't pay our bills. Just take it over. Run it. You know, here's, here's what they owe. Make the monthly payment. The store is yours. I'm like, oh, um, and I just give me like our family business was about 6,500 square feet. And this was more of like a chain store size, maybe like 20,000 square feet, 30,000 square foot store. And I'm like, oh, so I kind of knew if I made this move, I'm never getting out of the cigar industry. I literally took a 10 day trip to come down to Florida to think about it. Mm. Now, now, at this time, my only exposure to cigars was servicing these outside accounts. Mm -hmm. I kind of smoked home alone. You know, at night, I, you know, I'd have a cigar before I go to bed. I was still living with my parents in my early 20s. And um, I come down to Florida to my friend who had opened up a cigar shop. And um, I see this amazing culture. These guys, the guy, and, and we're in South Florida here, so it's very like. Oh, oh, I, I love it. We, we yeah. go there every year, except for COVID. But, <laughs> but it's very surreal as the people you'll find. So literally, I see one guy who's basically on unemployment looking for a job and then a guy next to him is a multimillionaire retired at 45 and they're laughing and talking like wow like, you don't see that happen anywhere you know hey, right we're mm -hmm. distinctly diverse different people are socializing and having a good time and these guys are going to dinners together and they're breaking bread and i kind of love this i'm like wow this is awesome so my buddy at the time says you know look if he knew why i was down there he goes, why don't you just stay down here we'll be partners here and i went mm. hmm so after about the 12th day, I get a call from my father. goes, uh, am I crazy? Or are you supposed to be back in Florida? I mean, back in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah about that. I'm not going at all. <laughs> yeah. It's not coming back. He's like, what? And, you know, he got pissed and whatever. I literally had to let him cool off for two months before I was able to fly back, load up everything in my truck and drive back <laughs> down here. But that's, that's how the journey began. Yep. After that, it's just been looking forward. I mean, that's how my 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 retail cigar journey here in Florida started. Yeah, I, I was so pumped when I when I met when I met my girl. She graduated from the University of Miami, and she's from the next town. From so we knew each other when we were real little, right? And when she came up from Miami, and she and she spent twenty three years of her life after she graduated down there. And and I had one foot out the door here in Rhode Island. This is pre Stogie Geeks. And and I was like, I'm gonna go down to South Florida. I'm gonna do a radio show. I know the technology to make it onlineable, like what I did at your store, right? I'm like, I'm gonna do a traveling cigar radio show in South Florida. And then I'm gonna and then now I can broadcast it not only here in the Providence Metro to give them a taste of the culture, but I can possibly call other stations because I was with the Cumulus Network, which was the second largest network besides the iHeart Radio. And I was like, I can like broadcast like everywhere if it comes to that sponsorships, this, that, and the other thing. And on our second date, she goes, This is the second time you mentioned that. I'm never moving back down to South Florida. And I'm, oh, like, wow. and I'm like, Oh, she goes, this is a game changer for us. I'm like, well, what do you mean us? Like, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, you just started dating, you know, you're on your second date. She goes, you need to tell me because you're like really passionate about that. And I was like, well, uh, let's just, let's see how we go. You know what I mean? Right. And, long, and long story painless, Abe, truth be told, she's considering moving. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> she's consider she's considered because she's like you know we live up here in the northeast it's so expensive this and that I'm like you know if we move down to South Florida I'm gonna get a gig in a cigar shop I'm gonna I could do Stogie Geeks now remote forever right because I'm on this network and right. you know we could try you know and 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 you you can how would you like to go per diem at work. And like, well, how would you like to work for fun in there? And you know how it is down South Florida. You know, you could take, you know, I took my son when he was a year and a month old to Little Havana. 
the the shop that we were in was smoke free. Everybody's smoking outside because the weather's so gorgeous, right? right? They got the Cuban band. She's dancing with the kid. Yep. She's dancing with the kid. It's smoke free. I'm on the deck smoking a Davidoff Robusto because you know you don't have that much time. You guys spend time right. with your family, and and she's like. This is amazing. I'm like, you lived here for 23 years after you graduated. <laughs> and we still have that conversation since. And then COVID hit with the momentum. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, we're going to move. And, and we, we we are in negotiations. I'm just one in the cigar world now. <laughs> that's, called, that's called the long game, Joe. Yes. Yes. That was the long game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, listen, let's do this. Like, let's do this. I, I. I went down South Florida like years and years. I was in my early 20s. And then even pre when I owned the cigar shop in Providence, and I just fell in love with the culture. Like, and, and for you Stogie, Stogie Geek listeners that are listening, like you owe it to yourself to take a trip and go to experience South Florida cigar culture. You will fall in love. Like, you, it's, just, it's just amazing. It's just, it, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I tell our patrons all the time. They don't realize how spoiled they are here in South Florida. Right? A lot of, it's like, <laughs> there's a lot of great, great shops. Yes, there are. Yeah. And then they don't realize and they go travel somewhere. Like, Man, I, I, can, dude, I keep telling you how lucky you guys are down here. Right. I And here at Security Weekly, I got permission to work remote. Cool. So I'm like, all the stars are aligned now. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I don't care if I'm at El Titan the Bronze selling five dollars cigars like Kai Ocho. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll still be on my computer doing my little cybersecurity thing at night or during the day and and, fi- and working there at night and figuring that out. It's so, a good idea. I like know, it. Oh, dude, uh, I I would love to. That's that's and we got to do this before the kids go to school. So let's do it. How's the school systems down there? I'm just personally asking. <laughs> Is it good? Everything's good down there. School uh, not. It depends where you are in the area, but there are good schools down here. Cool. So if just I ask you for advice, right if I ping you for advice and whatnot, that means you know I'm moving. I'll I'll let no you worries. know. I'll you put, know. You, put you in touch with the right people. And since you are hurting, now I'm going to go home and say, you know, I interviewed this guy, Abe. He, <laughs> he, he owns shops. He's hurting for employees. I'm just <laughs> saying. He's hurting for employees. Wrote him in from the beginning. <laughs> you, know, you know, but yeah, all kidding aside, like, I, it, it's just an amazing culture. So you fell in love with it. You just, and, and obviously well, 25 I've years. Been, I fell in love with the culture more than I fell in love with the product. It, me too. Me too. I could, I could smoke like three brands if I had to, and I would right. still do the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. So awesome, um, Abe. Thank you for your time. Thank you for letting us go over. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you for there. you guys. Uh, we definitely have to do it again for sure. So let's definitely stay in touch. Um, thank you. I want to thank Adam for joining me in studio and 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 asking his questions and and hanging out in studio it's always fun <laughs> and i want to thank my little dockhead kid texas my little dockhead kid from texas drew uh, over there uh, thank you for uh yeah. joining us and abe uh please don't be a stranger and best of luck to your your event all of thank your you. shops i wish you nothing but success and like thank i said it's absolute gravity like i follow you I look at your things and I'm like, man, like it, it's uh, the answer is is move down south. That's that. That's <laughs> all I have to say. Uh, Thanks, guys. For today, Stogie, thank you, Abe, for your time. Uh, Stogie Geeks, remember we keep the conversation going all week long. Visit StogieGeeks.com. If you have any complaints about the show, email Drew at StogieGeeks.com. My email is Joe H at StogieGeeks.com. Stogie Geeks, remember behind every cigar there's a story worth knowing. Get out there and shop local. Story Geeks, we'll see you next time. Peace.